Shalom, I'm Chris. Let's follow Jesus along the Talmudim way. Genesis 30. We're calling this one Jacob and Laban Continued. And this is actually going to continue for the next couple of chapters. This drama with Jacob, the trickster, meeting Laban, the, the master trickster. And they're just going to go back and forth here. And, and we'll uh, get into that as we move through this chapter. Acts 17.11 reminds us to receive the word with great eagerness, but always let the scripture be our guide. Not take anyone's word for it, but let the spirit uh, derive our meaning through the scripture. We are continuing the story of Jacob. So we've looked at the prehistory in the first 11 chapters, the story of Abraham from chapters 12 through 23, brief interlude on Isaac, and now we're in Jacob. And we're sort of in the middle of the Jacob saga, and that will lead us into the story of Joseph as we close out the book. In this chapter, we're going to begin with Rachel and Jacob arguing, and it's a scene that's somewhat reminiscent of Genesis chapter 16. Um, we'll get into that as we move through it. Then we'll have Jacob really meeting with all of his wives and concubines and ultimately having children by all of them. So we'll have Jacob and Bilhah, which is Rachel's handmaid, Zilpah, which is Leah's handmaid, Leah herself, and then ultimately Rachel herself as, as we're going to have Joseph born to uh, Rachel. Then after his time is completed, Jacob asks to leave, but Laban, of course, says, stay. And almost you can hear those words that he said in chapter 24, come, O blessed of the Lord, you know, come on and stay a while. What's the rush? And then we're going to have this weird scene of, of Jacob really do, doing some genetic modification of the livestock to get um, the stripes and, and speckles a, a certain way. So we'll unpack that as we move through. We're still in Haran, and the big thing to note here is it is outside the promised land. Jacob is not supposed to be there. He's supposed to be inside the promised land, back in the borders of what would be modern Israel today. And you can see that by the, the lower red box. Now, when Rachel saw that she had not borne Jacob any children, she became jealous of her sister and said to Jacob, Give me children, or else I am going to die. Then Jacob's anger burned against Rachel, and he said, Am I in the place of God, who has withheld you from the fruit of the womb? And this, in a sense, recalls Genesis chapter 16, but there's a little bit different twist here. Um, we've got Jacob being angry with Rachel. Abraham was never angry with Sarah. He may be questioned a little bit. Um, we're also going to see something similar with Isaac. And in Genesis 25, 21, Isaac is going to pray for Rebecca's barrenness, possibly for 20 years until the Lord finally opens her womb. But apparently self-absorbed Jacob was not doing this. And the sages actually scold Jacob for speaking harshly to his wife here, uh, particularly when you consider that she was emotionally suffering from her, her childlessness. So um, he even suggests here that Jacob's anger burned against Rachel. And he said, am I in the place of God who has withheld you from the fruit of the womb? So he's, he's suggesting here that the Lord has actually caused her barrenness. We have to remember that in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says in Matthew 5, 22, I say to you, everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. And how much more in the place of, of a husband or wife should a husband deal gently with his beloved wife? The sages further suggest that it is because of this treatment that Jacob's other sons by his other wives will be humbled and they will have to bow down before Rachel's son, Joseph. And so that's very interesting. We're going to see that as we move through. Once we get into the story of Joseph, Joseph goes to Egypt and ends up rescuing the uh, the family, and they're all going to bow down to him. Though not in anger, as what's fascinating is about this is Joseph is going to repeat the phrase, am I in the place of God? And he's going to do that in Genesis 50, verse 19. So we've got this double meaning when Jacob says in anger, am I in the place of God? And then Joseph is going to say that in humility, am I in the place of God? Then she said, here's my female slave, Bilhah, have relations with her that she may give birth on my knees so that by her I too may obtain a child. So she gave him her slave, Bilhah, as a wife, and Jacob had relations with her. And I would say sarcastically, because this worked out so well in Genesis 16, let's try it again. Uh, give birth on my knees is, in other words, place the child on Rachel's knees after Bilhah gives birth. And this will be a type of adoption procedure. 
Bilhah conceived and bore Jacob a son. Then Rachel said, God has vindicated me and has indeed heard my voice and has given me a son. Therefore, she named him Dan. And Rachel's slave Bilhah conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. So Rachel said, with mighty wrestling, I have wrestled with my sister and have indeed prevailed. And she named him Naphtali. So Dan means judged or judgment. We're going to see that the 12 tribes, uh, 12 sons eventually become the 12 tribes. And the 12 tribes are going to be allotted specific territory. So in other words, Dan can either mean the person Dan, the tribe Dan, or the geographic location Dan. Dan was initially allocated the area around modern Tel Aviv, and you can see that on the bottom of the map here. They couldn't hack it because this was actually Philistine territory, and they couldn't you know, dislodge them. So the tribe actually picked up roots and moved way, way up north um, to, to the region today that borders Lebanon, and it's all the area around Mount Hermon. And so sometimes we'll hear, encounter the phrase from Dan to Beersheba later in the Bible. And it's sort of like our expression coast to coast. This is basically an idiom for the entire country. Dan in the north to Beersheba in the south. So this is referring to the tribal allotment of Dan that they, they got as a sort of a second choice. And it is interesting. They're far north and they're the first to be picked off whenever people come invading from the north. So Dan uh, gets a little bit of the back of the hand, and we saw that in, in the book of Revelation. They're the, the tribe that's not named when we list the 12 tribes. So there's really something fishy going on with Dan, and it all has to do with uh, the introduction of idolatry. Really, all the 12 tribes speak of Messiah in, in some form. I've left that out in the interest of time. But uh, when it comes to Dan, meaning judge or judgment, we have to remember that Jesus is the ultimate judge. 2 Timothy 4.1, I solemnly exhort you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing and by his kingdom. And it moves on. So we have an ultimate judge and it's fortunate we're on good terms with him because Jesus is the ultimate judge of the universe. Naphtali uh, means struggled or wrestled, and this is actually going to have a foreshadow of Jacob's wrestling with God in chapter 32, this hint of wrestling. When Leah saw she had stopped having children, she took her slave Zilpah and gave her to Jacob as a wife, and how Leah's slave uh, and Leah's slave bore Jacob a son. Then Leah said, how fortunate. So she named him Gad. Gad means uh, fortune or fortunate. And Leah's slave Bill, uh, Zilpah bore Jacob a second son. And Leah said, happy am I, for women will call me happy, for she named him Asher. And Asher means happy or blessed. Blessed is probably a slightly better translation because being blessed is a state of being, where being happy is an emotion. So in other words, you're blessed whether you feel happy or not. And this distinction is actually going to become very necessary when we get to Matthew chapter 5 in our gospel study and the Beatitudes that we want to read, happy are those who are persecuted. But really, you know, you can't be happy being persecuted, but you can be blessed through the persecution. Now, in the days of the wheat harvest, Reuben went and found mandrake fruits in the field and brought them to his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But she said to her, is it a small matter for you to take my husband? And would you take my son's mandrakes also? So Rachel said, therefore, he may, he may uh, sleep with you tonight, meaning Jacob, in return for your son's mandrakes. We aren't entirely clear what Reuben's connection is to all this, other than what the text says. He, he found these uh, potato-shaped um, fruit and, and brought them to his mother. But it does give us a foreshadowing that something is wrong with Reuben in the purity department. The text could be glossing over something more sinister here as it relates to Reuben. But in chapter 5, we're going to be told outright that Reuben has relations with Bilhah. And that becomes an affront to Jacob. And that will actually cost Reuben his firstborn status. We also see a hint of Rachel's weakness here, because instead of trusting in God to open her womb, just as uh, as uh, Rebecca has done, she uh, R Rachel turns to folklore and superstition to help get her pregnant. And of course, it doesn't work. Uh, she's willing to trade a night with her beloved uh, to get what she wants. So that's that's how little she values Jacob. Uh, she's just, you know, here, take her uh, and just so I can get my way. Now, in the next chapter, we're going to see that Rachel also has a problem with idolatry. So things are not quite all up on the up and up with Rachel. So what are these mandrakes? They're actually love plants in Hebrew. <laughs> That's the translation. And they're an aphrodisiac. And so even today, they're associated with 
folklore and witchcraft. And it's a, a stemless perennial root that's in the potato family. And it's kind of found growing in, in the ground around there. It can either have two roots or, or one root. And when it has two roots, it resembles the female human torso. And when it has one root, it resembles something else that belongs to a male. It does have hallucinogenic and narcotic purposes. And so it, its shape and its fragrance and, and all of that may, you know, kind of led to the use of the, the fruit in basic fertility rites and thought of as an aphrodisiac. So uh, verse 16 says, When Jacob came in from the field in the evening, Leah went out to meet him and said, You must have relations with me, for I have indeed hired you with my son's mandrake. So he slept with her that night. I think it's more interesting that uh, Leah is apparently on the outs with Jacob, uh, or at least Jacob is very much too busy for uh, to have any time for Leah. While Rachel, on the other hand, seems to be in control of Jacob's social calendar, so she can dictate uh, who's going in to Jacob tonight, and you know, tonight it's your turn, tomorrow it's my turn. So apparently Jacob is, is truly not doing a very good job managing his household. God listened to Leah, and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. Then Leah said, God has given me my reward, because I have given my slave to my husband. So she named him Ishakar. So the name Ishakar is a combination of I have hired you, you have paid the wages, and my reward, which is Sakari. And there's a theme of wages that actually runs throughout this entire section and really from here through the rest of the book. We're going to see in the beginning, we saw in the beginning, that Jacob is told is asked what his wages should be and then we see that laban treats his daughters like servants you know giving each one of them as wages for services rendered later in this chapter jacob will renegotiate those terms and laban again will ask him what his wages should be and then in the next chapter jacob will comment that laban has changed jacob's wages 10 times so there's all this theme going through here and it's it's even in the very name ishakar the tribe Ishakar has a great praise in 1 Chronicles 12, 32, and it says the sons of Ishakar, men who understood the times with knowledge of what Israel should do. And in Luke 12, Jesus actually chides the people for not knowing the times. So this is a reminder that we need to be wise as serpents or with the world around us. Not that we become entrenched in the world system, but we shouldn't be victimized by it either. And there may be times where we're just outnumbered and persecution is going to happen. But until that day comes, we need to learn to be spiritual chess players and we need to start thinking several moves ahead. So, for example, you know, we see the current trajectory of things changing uh, with the world's or the nation's attitudes towards Christians. We're no longer the mainstream. We're often on the outskirts. So if, we, if this continues, think the next move down, right? We're not going to be allowed to worship in public. Now, this may be in our lifetime. It may be after our lifetime. But I think we need to be preparing for some serious persecution there. And then even beyond that, maybe maybe won't even be allowed to buy and sell. We saw a hint of that during the, the pandemic where certain people who didn't have a certain status uh, had to stay inside and other people could go outside. So kind of very 1930s Germany-ish things were happening. And whether you were personally affected by it or not, it, you have to notice that these things were happening. So then given that, you know, that those days are coming, what is our next move as individual believers and as a church going to be? Uh, I, I think we should be seriously thinking about organic home groups. Uh, even if we don't need to do it, at least we have have that option there and we have that infrastructure down we also need to learn to be self-sufficient um, even for just economic reasons the the food in the grocery stores is getting outrageously expensive and there may become a time where if, if we don't have a certain set of credentials we won't be able to buy or sell just like it talks about in revelation so all of these things mean we need to be looking at the times and have knowledge of what what our church should be doing uh, church capital c that means all of us Isaiah wrote in 62, Isaiah 62, 11, Behold your salvation, which is related to the word Yeshua, or Jesus is coming. Behold his reward, which is related to the word Ishakar, is with him, and his compensation before him. So again, focusing on wages. It's interesting that after taking time out with her fourth, fourthborn to praise God when Judah was born, Leah now returns to lamenting because of Jacob's neglect. And so we're going to see this theme here. So she says with Issachar, because I gave my slave to my husband. And we're going to see uh, the, the next son is going to make a reference to her husband also. Zebulon is related to choice gift. And so Leah conceived and bore a sixth son to Jacob. Then Leah said, God has endowed me with a good gift. 
Finally, my husband will acknowledge me as his wife. So there's the husband reference again. Because I had borne him six sons, so she named him Zebulun. Afterwards, she gave birth to a daughter and named her Dinah. Now, Dinah is interesting. She, we're not really given any circumstances of her birth. Her name does appear to be a feminine form of Dan, perhaps as a foreshadow of what will happen to both to her and the resulting aftermath by Simeon and Levi in a town called Shechem. We'll read about that in Genesis 34. So while the text may not say much, she op- occupies the seventh position among Leah's children. And so that's uh, symbolically significant there. So perhaps in naming Dinah, Leah had the sentiment that God had judged between my sister and I by giving me six sons and a daughter. So she had a total of seven children, very much blessed. Then God remembered Rachel and God listened to her and opened her womb. So she conceived and gave birth to a son and said, God has taken away my disgrace. And she named him Joseph, saying, May the Lord give me another son. We looked at this phrase, God remembers, uh, before with Noah and others. It's, and it has a sense of God remembers his covenant. So Rachel needs to learn it's not magical potions. It's not magical, or, you know, aphrodisiac fruit. But it's God's covenant with Abraham that results in God's opening of Rachel's room, a womb. Barren women were traditionally viewed as a curse, you know, being cursed. But in the Bible, it's actually it's the uh, the the rule rather than the exception that the barren woman ends up being uniquely blessed by God, and so the world looks on her in disgrace, but God sees her as favored. Opened here can also mean unlocked, meaning God alone has the key. And there's several verses we can point to there, but Revelation three and to the angel of the church in the Philadelphia write. Uh, he who is holy, he who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut and shuts and no one opens. So Messiah has the key um, to to all of us and, and the Messianic kingdom as well. Joseph is actually a combination of Yasaf, which means to add to, and Asaf, which means take away, which is kind of interesting. They sound contradictory, but from that we get the same name, Joseph. Now it came about that when Rachel had given birth to Joseph, Jacob said to Laban, send me away so that I may go to my own place and to my own country. Give me the wives and my children for whom I have served you and let me go for you yourself know my service, which I have rendered to you. This tends to foreshadow Moses saying, let my people go because Jacob, who will be named Israel, becomes a type of the nation. And of course, the the servitude of the nation under the oppressive Pharaoh leads Moses to be the, the ultimate deliverer there. So by now, seven years have passed, the second of seven, I should say, and Jacob now has fulfilled his obligation and he requests to leave. So even though you know Jacob should have been family to Laban, but more so Jacob is is just a, he's a money trail, right? Gravy train. Uh, he's primarily an indentured servant. And we're going to learn later that not only did Laban trick Jacob out of seven years of his life by the whole wife swap thing, Laban has actually changed <laughs> Jacob's wages 10 times. And we'll see that in Genesis 31 verse 7. But Laban said to him, if it pleases you at all, stay with me. I have determined by divination that the Lord has blessed me on your account. And of course, you know, we know he's full of it there. He continued, name your wages and I will give them. But Jacob said to him, you yourself know how I've served you and how your livestock have fared with me. For you have, you had little before I came and it has increased to a multitude. And the Lord has blessed you whenever, wherever I turned. But now, when shall I provide for my own household also? So Laban is, again, basically saying, come in, O blessed of the Lord. And in the ancient world, if the God spoke directly to you, it gave you more credibility. But it probably didn't take any supernatural divination to conclude that clearly Laban has been blessed by Jacob's presence. I mean, it was only because of Jacob's shepherding that Laban's flocks increased. And apparently Laban took it all and left Jacob with nearly nothing. So Laban said, what shall I give you? And Jacob said, you shall not give me anything. If you will do this one thing for me, I will again pasture and keep your flock. Let me pass through your entire flock, removing from there every speckled or spotted sheep, every black sheep among the lambs, and the spotted or speckled among the goats, and those shall be my wages. So my honesty will answer for me later when you come concerning my wages. Everyone that is not speckled or spotted among the goats or black among the lambs, if found with me, will be considered stolen. Laban said, good, let it be according to your word. So Jacob here is negotiating to receive speckled or spotted livestock for his service. But of course, it is Laban we're dealing with here. Um, Laban is actually going to reverse these terms we're going to see in the next chapter. 
But as we're about to see, the Lord is now with Jacob. The more Laban tries to swindle Jacob, the more the Lord blesses Jacob. Jacob evidently is anticipating some more trickery from Laban. I love this passage. So my honesty will answer for me later. These are two of the most dishonest characters in the entire Old Testament. And, you know, Jacob's, <laughs> Jacob's saying, hey, I'm honest. You're honest. Let's, let's just work this out. But immediately after making the arrangement, Laban's going to go ahead and remove all of the solid colored, all but the solid colored animals to eliminate any possibility that Jacob would get anything. So he, Laban, removed on that day the striped or spotted male goats and the speckled spotted female goats, everyone with white on it and all the black ones among the sheep and put them in the care of his sons. And he put a distance of three days journey between himself and Jacob. And uh, Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flock. So again, Laban is Laban. He's again going to try to trick Jacob. Oh, I I guess there are no speckled or spotted goats. I'm so sorry about that. Uh, I guess you don't get anything and I get everything. But we're going to see Jacob is, is a step ahead. Now, the next passage gets really weird. It talks about this weird procedure with rods and, you know, put white stripes on them and put them in water and all that kind of thing. Um, this may sound like folklore and mythology, but really, if we fast forward to Genesis 31, this may improve our understanding of this odd procedure that Jacob is going to institute back in chapter 30. So if we fast forward, we see... And it came about at the time when the flock was breeding that I raised my eyes and I saw in a dream. And behold, the male goats that were mating were striped, speckled, or molted. Then the angel of God said to me in the dream, Jacob. And I said, here I am. He nanny. And he said, now raise your eyes and see that all the male goats that are mating are striped, speckled, or molted. I have seen everything that Laban has been doing to you. I am the God of Bethel where you anointed a memorial stone, where you made a vow to me. Now arise, leave this land, and return to the land of your birth. So I think th this is, so Jacob got this dream, and this is going to help explain what we see in the next passage. Uh, so if we go back to chapter 30, verse 37, then Jacob took fresh rods of poplar, almond, and plane trees, and peeled white stripes in them, exposing the white that was in the rods. He set the rods which he had peeled in front of the flocks and in the drinking troughs, that is, in the watering channels where the flocks came to drink, and they mated when they came to drink. So the flocks mated by the rods, and the flocks delivered striped, speckled, and spotted off spring. So, spring. so even though uh, you know we, this sounds really weird, I think with the background of the Genesis 31 segment, we see that Jacob is you know got this from God, and and God has uh, God is giving him this. But in any case, he does continue the trickster theme instead of confronting Laban on his theft, Jacob then has to devise a, a, a counter strategy. And again, without that Genesis 31 passage, it looks like he's using some kind of magic and folklore. And even some commentators state that this is exactly what Jacob is doing. But I think once we read Genesis 31, we have a little bit different view on it. Then Jacob separated the lambs and made the flocks face towards the stripe and all the black in the flock of Laban. And he put his own herds apart and did not put them with Laban's flock. Moreover, when the stronger of the flock were mating, Jacob would place the rods in the sight of the flock in the drinking troughs so that they would mate by the rods. But when the flock was sickly, he did not put them in. So the sickly were Laban's and the stronger were Jacob's. You just got to love this trickery going on here. So the man became exceedingly prosperous and had large flocks and female and male servants, camels and donkeys. So even with God's intervention, Jacob is Jacob, and he has to add some insurance by segregating the strong from the sickly, resulting in sheep that were either speckled and strong or sheep that were solid and weak, and, and the solid and weak went off to Laban. So again, he's he can't trust God completely. He's got to do this extra step and this extra dig in. So whether it was God or whether it was magic or folklore, the, the sheep were affected by whatever this procedure was. And I think, let's assume that's the case, and, and they were influenced by what Jacob put in front of their eyes and what he gave them to ingest. Um, I think that's a, a startling picture of us because we are too sometimes too, too strongly influenced by the things of this world and by the things that we take in, and particularly images. When we see images that are shocking, sexual, violent, or perverse, you know, the imprint in our brain lasts long after the image is, is no longer in view. We even have this expression today, oh, you can't unsee that. 
Um, but still, we want to look at these things and we're drawn to them. The, the news media says if it bleeds, it leads because they know that we're drawn to this, you know, extra gory and graphic images. So I think exposed to these types of images repeatedly, and that makes us become desensitized. And then over time, the images will become a permanent part of our internal being because they are they become imprinted on our brains, just like whatever this this thing was going on with the sheep changed their DNA. I think it changes our DNA as well, changes who we are. So let us not be like that. Let us be careful with what we take in. And so Talmudim have to guard our eyes. And like David said, in a, in a moment of strength, I will set no worthless thing before my eyes that shall not cling to me. A perverse heart shall leave me. I will know no evil. My eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land that they may dwell with me. One who walks in a blameless way is one who will serve with me. So let's always keep that in mind. Next time, we'll continue the drama of Jacob and Laban in Genesis 31. So we'll see you then. Mm -hmm.